evening. This is Steve Hacklin, Dr. Cox Chair, calling this meeting to order for Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. With that call to order, we will move to the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Caught me off guard there. So. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we will turn it over to uh, Melinda Stevens for the roll call. Run. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. All right, here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Present. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Bill Holen, Arapahoe County. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Solzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, Sitting County, Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. City and County of Denver, Nicholas Williams. Yeah. Uh, City and County of Denver, Kevin Flynn. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Here. Tracy Craftsart, Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Ferre, City of Arvada. Sure. Dustin Svonek, City of Aurora. Juan Marcano, City of Aurora. Larry Vidum, Town of Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Junie Joseph, Boulder. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Duke. All right. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. <laughs> Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Good evening. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Yeah. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Lisa Jones, Foxfield. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Tuchere, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. John Cameron, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Wynne Shaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Here. Yep. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Here. Pauline Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Netherland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerley, Superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. I'm here. Thank you, Jessica. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bruce Baker, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Here. Darius Pakba, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Here. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, you may have noticed Director Sangren's voice was kind of out there on the internet. She is virtual. <laughs> uh, this is our first meeting where we allow for the virtual option with approval from the chair. She reached out to me earlier today and that was approved. So uh, this is a good test run of us kind of seeing how that works and we ask everybody's indulgence as we kind of uh, maneuver through that. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, we have an agenda. I would ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, there you go. We have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions. Thank you very much. We have an agenda. Uh, report of the chair, just a couple things from me before I turn it over to the, the committee chairs. Uh, first off, the executive director review. Uh, thank you to those of you that have completed that process, filled that out. 
Uh, the, the form is still open. So if you've not had a chance to do that, we would ask that you do. That's incredibly helpful to the Performance and Engagement Committee as they work with and talk to Doug and take a look at the, their performance. So we would appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank staff and everyone involved with the awards gala. Uh, that was phenomenal. What a, what a great time and what a great opportunity to, to show off the organization and all the pictures that have been going by as, as part of that. Um, just a, a wonderful event, and, and the chair appreciates everyone's work and attention and, and attendance at that event. And then finally, uh, ballots have hit for anybody on ballots. How many people are on a ballot this cycle? Good luck to everyone appearing on the ballot. So best of luck to you, uh, and I'm one of those people as well. Uh, with that, we will turn it over for a report on the Performance and Engagement Committee. Uh, Director Ward pinch it tonight. So. Do you have a report, Director Ward? Um, I think the only thing really is just a reminder, like Chair Conklin said, to fill out the Executive Director's uh, performance and engage, uh, performance review. And then the only other thing we really talked about was a debrief of the award ceremony, uh, things to do for next year, what not to do next year, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And a report on the Finance and Budget Committee, Director Whitlow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks to the committee and the staff for putting the agenda for our finance and budget committee, and thanks for those who attended tonight. Um, we had two action items, and the first one was to execute a contract with Consumer Direct Care Network, inclusive of a $95 monthly fee per enrolled participant for a two-year term commencing January 1st of 2024 with three one-year options to renew upon satisfactory performance. And the second one was to accept funds from SOLA for in the Colorado Energy Mineral Impact Assistance Fund in the amount of $125,000 for a one-year term to support the development of a regional housing needs assessment. That is my report, Chair, and I again thank you very much for staff and the committee for tonight their time. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the report of the Executive Director, Doug, we decided it was so much fun having a singing telegram. We're going to build that into every meeting. <laughs> oh, boy. Thank you very much. And well, I have the mic, though. It's a special uh, Director Shaw. Her birthday is tomorrow. So there you go. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everyone. Uh, just a few things from me. Again, I would I'd, uh, be remiss if I didn't thank you all so very, very much for your attendance at the at the award celebration. Um, I hope you had a wonderful time. I heard from a number of you, and I I think it was a tremendous success. Like all like all events of that nature, you know that it doesn't come without without some drawbacks and and uh, things uh, uh, opportunities for improvement. So we're we're you're curious to get your thoughts on that. If you have anything specific, please reach out to myself or Steve, Steve Erickson, and uh, we'll get those to the proper people for sure. So thank you all so very much. We had great numbers. We had 480 attendees at the event, um, 38 board members. So thank you for being there. Um, and we honored 21 people, projects, and plans from the, uh, with Metro Vision, Way to Go, and Distinguished Service Awards. And we honored the immediate past chair, of course, uh, Director Kevin Flynn for his, uh, his time on, on the executive committee. So thank you again, sir, for your, for your uh, commitment and, uh, to this high paying, high paying job that it is. <laughs> oh, shoot, that wasn't supposed to tell. Um, and then of course we capped off the evening with the John V. Christensen Award. As, as you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that we try to keep secret until the announcement and we honored uh, uh, Herb Atchison, former mayor of Westminster and of course past board chair on the Dr. Cog board. So, all in all, an excellent event. Thank you all so very much. Uh, regional housing strategy. Uh, so we are officially under contract, or we have officially entered a contract with, uh, with our consultant, and the consultant is Echo Northwest um, with subs MIG and community planning strategies. So we've hit the ground running. Staff has already done quite a bit of work prior to uh, the consultant uh, folks getting on. So we're really excited to get going. Our first step is to focus on data analysis to better understand the breadth and the scale of, uh, of the housing need across the region. And then after we're done with that, and we'll get into an analysis of understanding the barriers that hinder housing preservation and development within our region. 
We do have a robust uh, public engagement plan uh, as part of this too, part of which we're, we have an advisory committee that we're forming. Um, it's made up of local staff representatives, professionals in the area of housing development, housing finance, economic analysis, land use law, and uh, staff representation from our peer organization. So we're excited about that. Um, the consultant will also be hosting a number of focus groups. So if you're interested in hosting, a focus group, we would we would definitely welcome that opportunity. So please consider that. Um, the entire assessment process we're hoping to have complete by May of 2024. First deliverables are uh, at the end or early 2024. Then that's what we're hoping to, at least in part, to um, to inform uh, the, the the work of the legislature coming year. So stay tuned to that. Oh, we do have some good news with regards to the housing needs assessment. I, um, Finance and Budget Committee knows this, and it was mentioned tonight that um, we, you know, our full scope that we have planned for the housing needs assessment, we did not have a, a full fiscal strategy for that. We were waiting on uh, the, uh, the hope of, uh, of um, some grant monies through DOA, and we were successful in getting that to the tune of $125,000. So we're very appreciative of that. And appreciative that they understand the importance of the the work and the results that will that will come out of this this study. So again, thank you, and thank you to staff Sheila and all her folks for all the tremendous work on a very very fast moving uh, uh, product right now. Um, let me see two other things I want to mention real quick. One is uh, Dr. Cog. We just finished our annual audit. Um, our auditor, Clifton Larson Allen, CLA, um, and it, it was a clean audit. So I, I want to again thank Jenny Dock, our finance director, and all her staff. As, as you all know, you guys have been through all these. It's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, we, we continuously do have the clean audit. So we're truly appreciative of all the efforts of Jenny, her staff, and, of course, all of our division directors and, and, uh, and, and staff that report to them. The last thing I want to mention and is... Um, Last year, I, I just want to close the loop on this, because last year, um, Dr. Cog, as many of you did, opted out of the Family Leave Act. And, and when we had that discussion and ultimate action, you, you all allowing us to opt out, we had mentioned that there, we did recognize that there were some gaps in, in our, our policy, our short-term short -term disability plan. Um, most notably, as it relates to uh, family members, short-term disability just we, uh, we offer part the, the benefit to the actual employee and not family. Well, and we, with the hope that once we come to um, um, enrollment time that there would be some, some third party um, insurance plans out there. And indeed there are, and uh, we have selected one. So I just wanted you to know that we're closing that gap and, and uh, we will, as of uh, 20, January 1st, 2024, be offering short-term disability to family members as well as staff. So with that, Mr. Chair. Oh, if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about that policy, please reach out to myself, and I'll get you in contact with Randy Arnold, our, our um, um, Human Resources Director, and he can walk you through it. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you very much. Just a couple of quick uh, items as well. Uh, at the end of the meeting, if you're parked in the garage and don't already have a parking pass, the most popular person in the room, right there, we'll have those at the end. Uh, also, um, for those that, that haven't been here before, hallway, there's coffee, there's uh, cookies, there's also the restroom down the hallway. And if you could, uh, your name badges, if possible, point those towards me uh, in case we have conversations so that you can be recognized. So thank you very much for all of that. With that, we will move to public comments. Uh, up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be all allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker, should we have speakers. Okay. Last call for public comment. Okay, we will move forward on the agenda. Uh, our first consent agenda item, or the consent agenda item, is to move and adopt the consent agenda, which includes the summary of the September 20th meeting, and also amendments to the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Vidim, and a second from Director Pulaski. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay, and any abstention? Thank you very much. With that, we will move forward to our action items. The first action item is discussion of the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, or RTONT. Sounds like an old uh, convenience store back in the day. RTONT uh, for FY 2024 and 2027 Transportation Improvement Program, CHIP Set Aside Program, Project Funding Recommendations. And our presenter is Greg uh, McKinnon, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I won't introduce myself because everybody did a great job at it. Uh, but I will say the, the uh, Regional Transportation Operations Technology set aside was identified in the TIP that uh, was just in the consent agenda. Um, and this was the process to uh, do the call for projects and uh, make recommendations for sele project selections. It was based on the Regional Transportation Operations Technology Strategic Plan. Uh, which has the uh, priority initiatives of improving situational awareness, improving performance monitoring, and improving uh, multimodal and multi-jurisdictional coordination. The call for projects was a two-step process where uh, there was a uh, call for letters of interest and uh, the, the um, stakeholders and, uh, uh, and applicants with the letters of interest uh, came together for a letter of interest form. Uh, where we discussed uh, all the letters of interest in the open to prompt better coordination uh, between uh, the applicants and to ensure that we're going to be getting quality applications. Those applications came in uh, July 7th and were reviewed by the evaluation panel uh, according to the, the set-aside policies document, document guide. Uh, each of the evaluators uh, assessed their scores and provided rankings, and then uh, the, the group came together and uh, collectively um, uh, reviewed the, the total uh, rankings and scoring and uh, made recommendations based on that scoring and uh, the uh, value to the region. Uh, the details are included in attachment C of your packets, so we won't go over those. Uh, here's a summary of the scoring. Uh, the weighted average score uh, ranges from 0 to 5 uh, is the maximum. Uh, the scoring here um, uh, range from 1.1 to uh, just less than 2.5. The, uh, the evaluation committee also uh, looked at two other scoring methods and uh, in each case kind of had the same results and there was a, a distinct break in the, the lower quarter of, of the list. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of the programming. Twelve projects were uh, selected for funding. Uh, most were for full funding and uh, awarded funds in the, in the years requested. Uh, some were adjusted uh, due to um, uh, the requirement that had to be on the regional roadway system, the, the request for investments on, on that regional roadway system, or other uh, variances like that. In the case of Littleton, uh, the funding from uh, the FY27 and their request was pushed into FY26 to fit within the, the three-year program. Um, and two of the jurisdictions were, uh, are, the, the full funding is contingent on um, the completion of a concept of operations, a, a formal uh, document that describes the functional requirements of the system and the roles and responsibilities of the, uh, of the participants. And uh, then my final slide here is the recommended motion uh, for approving the, uh, the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Uh, sir. The ranking goes up to five, even weighted. Those scores don't strike me as very high, and I'm curious why we don't have better better uh, requests. I don't know. They're just sort of average. That's an astute observation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to see higher scores too.
Maybe I can just follow up and say, um, did you learn anything from the process that could be fed back to people so that we could get higher scores? Sorry. Yes. Um, the, the letter of interest, the two-step process is a good foundation, but I think that we may need to make more effort in that process where we're trying to ensure the quality applications. Uh, the, and I think that's more of an interactive process than, than we did this time. We, we did an evaluation and expressed uh, the opinions, had discussions, uh, but I think that we need to be a partner uh, somewhat in the process to make sure that uh, there's a follow-up on, on what we did discuss in the letter of interest forum. Thank you for the question, Director Cameron. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Move to approve the project allocations through the fiscal year. Of 2027 Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Transportation Improvement Program set aside and administratively modify the Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you, Director. And a second from Director Peck. Any final discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, nay. And any abstention? Thank you very much and thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Moving ahead, item number 10, discussion of the fiscal year 2024-2025 project selection for fiscal year 2024-2027 transportation improvement program quarter planning set aside program. And with that, we will have Nora Kern, manager of transportation planning and operations presents. Welcome, thanks for being here. All right, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as, okay, as you said, my name is Nora Kern. I'm the program manager for our sub area and project planning team, talking about uh, the selection for another one of our set asides. Um, so, this set aside is our quarter planning set aside. Um, for those keeping track, this is one of our new set asides. So, um, it's uh, kind of set up a little bit differently as well. Um, like a couple of our new set-asides, we are actually planning on retaining these funds. So we're selecting projects, but Dr. Cog is going to help manage the projects, help with procurement, um, and kind of work closely with our, our uh, member governments on these projects. So the focus of the quarter planning program is specifically on the projects and the priorities that are outlined in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, in fact, the only um, corridors that are eligible are the corridors that are specifically identified in in that plan, um, you can see a quick snapshot of that uh, of the map of those corridors and, and projects there on the left side. Um, we did pilot this program because it's a new one. We wanted to kind of give it a, a test run the first um, year. So we had two quarter studies we're in the middle of right now. That's the Alameda Avenue corridor study and the South Boulder Road corridor study. Um, and so we are now kind of formalizing this program as part of the 2024 to 2027 um, Transportation Improvement Program. Um, within that program, we have $3 million dedicated for this quarter planning program, and we intend to split those $3 million into two two-year cycles. So today we're kind of talking about that first two-year cycle. Um, just a quick note, so like I said, this is for um, any quarter that's identified in the Regional Transportation Plan. There were a couple limitations we did put on the selection. Um, first, we obviously don't want to pick and do more planning work on quarters where projects are already underway, construction and design, or other planning efforts. So really focus on those quarters where there is a planning need and uh, an area where we can really help support the region. Um, we also weren't focused on um, limited access roads and freeways and trails and multi-use paths. So a quick uh, glance at our timeline. Um, we did start this process over the summer. We actually started by looking at all of the corridors and projects in the regional transportation plan and doing some initial assessment to think about which ones might be a good fit so we could start some conversations with the uh, staff at local agencies. Um, we then had a, a letter of interest window over the summer as well as some, some meetings with um, agency staff. We had a selection committee that included Dr. Cog, RTD, uh, CDOT Region 1 and Region um, 4 staff, um, and that uh, committee recommended um, what we have today before us. Um, I will just note, too, before we move along on the timeline, we are planning on having the second call for um, letters of interest for that second two-year cycle um, in the summer of 2025. 
So we received um, four letters of interest for three different projects, and I'll just um, skim through these real quick to let you know what we received. Uh, we received interest in the Sheridan Boulevard Vision Zero study. Um, this was submitted by both Lakewood and Denver. Um, you can see on the map it, can, can, it covers 52nd to Hamden, and it's identified in the first staging period, the 2020 to 29 staging period, um, for Vision Zero quarter improvements. Uh, the next study that was submitted was submitted by Aurora. Um, it is an, a study looking at the extension of the bus rapid transit line on the East Colfax corridor. I'm extending it from 225 to E470. Um, so it would include looking at both bus rapid transit service and um, other supporting safety and multimodal improvements. Um, and then our third and final corridor was submitted by Lakewood. Um, it was a, recommending a study of the West Colfax transit, looking at uh, transit between Sheridan and Oak Street Station. So um, we did have a, a variety of evaluation criteria, which you can see on the screen, generally looking for alignment with our Metrovision and Regional Transportation Plan, as well as impact to or benefit to environmental justice communities, regional impact and planning need. And you can see the scores um, combined. These, these are the average scores for the, all of the selection panel members. So Sheridan did come out with the highest score, followed by the um, closely behind the East Colfax BRT extension. So the selection committee did recommend both the Sheridan Boulevard Vision Zero study and the East Colfax BRT extension for funding. Um, the West Colfax Transit study was not recommended at this time, um, primarily because it's not, doesn't quite align with what's in the Regional Transportation Plan, so we'll look to work with Lakewood if they're interested in, in updating that and making sure everything's kind of lined up. And then um, if there are any under, unused funds, um, after we kind of go through scoping and procurement, the recommendation would be to save those for the, the final two years of the set-aside. So with that, I have a motion um, for your consideration. Sure, so I. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I was disappointed, obviously, to see that West Colfax wasn't funded, particularly since half of the uh, scope of the area is under the approved list. So, you know, it is adjacent. But the note in here says um, to, it, that there could be an amendment to the regional transportation plan. I'd love to understand what that process could look like. It, it wasn't really clear from the Hundred page document on online. So. <laughs> sure. Well, um, my colleague Alvin is actually here to talk about that uh, process later. Um, we did have a window um, for those amendments, and I don't believe Lakewood submitted one. Um, but uh, we we will be updating the doing a full update of the regional transportation plan starting next summer. So um, the the West Colfax Transit study it's in the final or the relevant projects are in the final staging period. So would would love to talk kind of as we go into the next update of the regional transportation plan about what makes sense on that corridor. So that the window that was available September to like early October, is that an annualized process that we can expect every year? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't want to steal Alvin's thunder, but um, I, I think the generally it's um, every two, uh, it's in between. So the, the regional transportation plan is every four years by federal mandate. And so potentially we look to have updates every um, two years in between those four years. I've got a question in my role as, as Edgewater representative, and it's a question I asked yesterday as well, so I apologize for the, for the repetition, but I want it on the record in as many places as possible. So the 52nd to Hamden Sheridan project, you know, one of the things here was that, that projects that were already in process weren't you know, considered. A stretch of Sheridan Edgewater is working with Denver and with, with, with CDOT. I want to be sure that this is not supplanting that, this is not stalling that, this is not replacing that. Yes, yeah, yeah, happy to touch on that again. So the intent, particularly with the Sheridan, is there's, there's a number of projects and work going on, so we don't want to recreate or slow down or um, kind of generally get in the way, but really we're just looking to expand that work to include all the jurisdictions along Sheridan um, and also look to how, how else we can kind of help move that, for, that core together and particularly addressing safety because there are so many serious and fatal crashes on that corridor. Thank you for indulging okay. uh, that question yeah. again. I appreciate it. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Dr. Shaw. Thank you. I move to approve funding the Sheridan Boulevard Vision Zero Corridor Study and the East Colfax 
bus rapid trans transit extension study through the first two years of the corridor planning set aside program of the fiscal year 2024 to 2027 tip. And a second, second. Dr. Maurer. So thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Any final discussion? Being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay and any abstentions? Thank you very much. Being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, moving ahead to informational briefings, item number 11, an update on status and efforts on the IIJA Regional Grants Navigator Program. And Flo Rotano, Director, Dr. Uh, Rotano is here, Director of Partnership Development and Innovation. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to turn it directly over to Paul Desitis with EST Inc. Um, EST Inc. was contracted by Dr. Cog to provide the regional grant navigation services as part of the, the funding received from the Office of Economic Development and International Trade for the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, OGN. So, Paul? Right. Hello, everybody, and good evening. I haven't spoken to this group since I was the CDOT Region 1 director, so it's been a couple years. Thought maybe I was done with that, but I'm here. <laughs> um, anyway, it's my, my uh, pleasure to present to you all tonight, and I was coming over here, and I was thinking to myself, you know, the thing I miss the most is the opportunity to serve the public, and so I just wanted to thank you all for what you do, it's very important work. So anyway, um, as part of uh, this grant, this uh, contract that EST has with Dr. Cog, there, I am the Dr. Cog Regional Grant Navigator. And so um, across the state of Colorado, there are 14 grant navigators aligned with the DOLA transportation regions. And uh, I am supporting all of the needs in the Dr. Cog uh, area. And so to that end, I've been meeting with many of the jurisdictions and you may have heard my name and looking forward to meet with those who we have not met with yet. So what is that role of the Grant Navigator? Just a quick refresh if you have not heard much about us. So it is really just to support the local governments to understand uh, the funding grant opportunities out of three federal acts, so IIJA, otherwise known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. So out of those three programs, there are literally hundreds of grant opportunities. And unless you uh, don't have a lot on your plate, it is really hard for people to focus on the hundreds of grants and all these different opportunities and understand all the federal requirements that come with that. So the Regional Grant Navigator Program is really to help you all succeed with that process. And my job is exactly the same as what I had at CDOT, is to help you get money for projects and uh, be successful in delivering things. So as Flo said, it is a partnership between the Governor's Office, OEDIT, DOLA, and uh, really just meant to put some bookends around these big grant programs. All right, so uh, some things we've heard. We've been visiting with a lot of local governments and we've heard uh, you know, just some anecdotal things and it really uh, depends on the size of the municipality in general that we've heard various comments from. So can it any, be anything from city of Denver where they have dedicated grant people who focus on grants to, I, I'll use the example of Foxfield. I don't know if they're here tonight, but uh, their public works department is a couple people. And so uh, much harder for them to understand the grant programs. So it takes, uh, what we're, we've heard is it takes uh, time and money, staff time, everybody's busy, those kind of things. And then if the project's actually awarded, then there's the grant compliance aspect and making sure that you don't do anything that uh, causes you to lose that grant funding. So that's probably why the smaller municipalities uh, really question whether they should go after and do the grant program or not. 
So I think it's important to understand that, uh, you know, CDOT, where I came from, or Dr. Cog, uh, and certainly many of the jurisdictions in this room navigate federal contracts successfully routinely. So this isn't anything new, but it is important to be aware of some of the strings that come with that kind of funding. So uh, to help you all, one of the things we've learned is it's probably better not to think about pie in the sky ideas for projects as you're going through and deciding, you know, what kind of project can I uh, develop and get grant funding for? It's better to have a good defined scope. So really think strategically within your communities about um, developing a good scope. Uh, if you have a NEPA study, if you have a planning study, a lot of that stuff will really help you define a good scope. And then, um, you know, in that you're really specifying a problem and uh, then finding solutions for that problem. And you're really telling a story about why is this a good grant project. And remember, the people grading the grant projects are probably in Washington, D.C., and may not know your community, probably don't. And so you really want to explain that story to them. So, um, and we can help you. The RGN can help you through that process, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's say uh, you're a municipality, you've thought strategically, and you have a good project scope, and now I think I found a grant match. Okay, great. You found a grant, uh, grant match. Now we think you really need to read that notice of funding opportunity. And this is, um, if you've read any of these, I don't know uh, if anybody in the room is brave enough to say they've spent some time reading a NOFO, but it is, it's, uh, it's not the most exciting reading in the world, a lot of technical stuff. So EST went and hired CDOT's ex-grant coordinator, uh, Julie George, and she had some good advice for you all as you're going through and reading that. Really hard to read the document, but as you go through and read that document, you're really asking yourself, does my scope fit what the grant requirements are? And she actually goes through and she gets a Word document over and she pulls the important salient things from that grant and then creates a, um, an outline for the future grant proposal. And uh, with that, she's making sure she answers all those questions. And when she's done with that, she's now got the bones for the future grant proposal. And she knows that that project really fits all these very specific requirements that they have. Later on, um, you know, as you're thinking through this, you may say, we don't have staff availability. Just know that there is support for writing grants. OEdit is supposed to come out with a, I don't know if they did yet, but they're coming out with a uh, grant writing list of consultants and they have some funding to do that. And um, so even if you are staff or financial constrained, there is gonna be resources to help you do that. Um, and then uh, think about timing of grant writing as well. We had a municipality come to us several and say, can you guys drop everything and write a grant? It's due next week. And, uh, you know, and we just couldn't, couldn't do that. So we did try to find some people who could drop everything. But it's more than just having the time to write that grant. You're doing letters of support. You're getting uh, the elected officials on board. You're really, there's more than just writing that grant application. So um, just like everything, get out in front of it. Um, the RGN can help you with that, and I'll show you some tools on how you can kind of navigate the grant program and understand that uh, you're keeping an eye out, and then when these grants have the notice of funding opportunity, you jump on it right away, because if you get out in front, then it goes a lot easier, right? And then, uh, you know, there's always then the fear, like, oh, wow, we got the grant, awesome. Um, and that we've heard some stories about uh, Build America, Buy America, and losing grant funding. So there are federal requirements that you do have to follow, and I don't want to scare anybody, but you do uh, want to make sure you have that experience or hire that experience of people who can make sure you don't lose the grant funding once you got it. All right. So uh, Dr. Cog is great. Um, keep applying for the Dr. Cog TIP funding. Um, I did talk to the uh, city manager of Commerce City, Sean Poe, and he let me use Commerce City as an example because they are really doing a good job in going after grant funding. They have uh, really made it a priority. EST has actually written uh, raise grants for them, TIP, Dr. Cog TIP grants, uh, other types of federal grants, and you know, um, 
it's just um, they're even going so far as putting an RFP on the street for grant support so that they can uh, really make an effort to go after grant funding when it comes up. And um, I, I, I'll use them as example. We were actually writing a reconnecting communities grant for them. We went through that NOFO. We said, you know what, this is a weak application. Let's pull the plug and wait for another uh, grant opportunity to come up. So um, in, their, in their case, they had a great project. And over time, the scope of that project has grown. And due to cost inflation, the costs have grown, but they have a good match. And so grant funding can really provide you a supplement to a project that has most of the funding. Now you've got the match and you've got a reason to kind of go forward. Um, all right, and don't give up. Multiple years may be necessary. So we wrote a raise grant for Commerce City. It came in fourth in the state and only top three were funded. So that was depressing. It's, it's sort of like if you're a consultant, you don't get the project, it's depressing. So, uh, but you don't give up. And we highly recommend that you go to the grant agency, uh, FHWA in that case, they give you really good grant feedback. And then you've already written the grant. A lot of these grants came out this year, but they'll come out again next year. And so there's opportunities and it's not a waste of time. And I'll bet you we'll get some grant funding eventually. Um, also, um, just when it comes to letters of support, don't just think sort of, well, uh, we've got all the local jurisdictions on board, they've all given us the nice letter of support, and it's the same one example that we sent to each of them, and they all signed it dutifully. Um, in the case of a grant that we were working on with them, we got the railroad involved, we got the welding shop involved, we got the church involved. We were really trying to get letters from businesses saying, hey, this is part of the story, this is gonna help my business, this is gonna help our community. So we started with the important letters of support, you gotta get those and a matching contribution is always nice. But then we expand that letter of support out to other interested parties to help explain the story. All right, I'm moving fast. Uh, the uh, grant tools that we like. So this one's a brand new one, and there are probably, I would say, thousands of web pages devoted towards grants. So unless you want to read them all, um, there's some good websites out there, and this is a new one that's out there, and uh, it's in your packet, so you don't have to write down the internet address. But if you just type in the date range, it's, it'll tell you, here's how many NOFOs are out there right now and here's when they're due. And so that's a way, if you can imagine, how do you wade through, this is the biggest problem we've had, how do you wade through hundreds of grant opportunities? If you go to grants.gov, that's a great app. Uh, you can go to it and type in resiliency and it'll pop out 100 different hits on grants. Um, this one is active grants, things that you can fit to your project. So we like that website. I'm going to put a plug in for Dr. Cog because we use this all the time when rent, uh, writing grants. Dr. Cog has a tip data tool. It's got demographics in there, crash rates, you know, all these different kinds of things that you need to get data for to answer questions for your grant. So good job, Dr. Cog, with that. Um, very excellent tool. So um, just some lessons learned, too. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, telling this story. Make sure when you're writing a grant, you're talking about all the impacts to your community, whether it's tourism related, safety related, medical access, you know, with broadband, they're talking about virtual doctors, uh, things like that. Resiliency is a big word now, impact to businesses, those kind of things. Don't miss anything that a project's gonna help you with. And then show innovation. So we put in a uh, grant application, and we thought we did some really good engineering. We we're gonna do some stormwater detention under the roadway, and that's what we did. And we thought, well, that's just good engineering. Well, they rated that really high, but meanwhile, we had what we thought was the coolest piece of innovation, which was a dynamic lane, lane assignment where sometimes the lane is a through lane, sometimes it's a left lane based on changing traffic demand. And they said that was medium. They didn't. So the, Anyway, we didn't, uh, we didn't see it that way, but uh, just shows you show all the innovation. Don't think that what you're doing doesn't have good innovation. Um, all right, so uh, I talked about our big Dr. Uh, Dr. Cog Regional Grant Navigator team. Um, we've got experts available to help you in all the disciplines, whether that's bridge, roadway, geotechnical, 
traffic engineering. We've got the uh, grant writing capability with Julie George, who used to be CDOT's grant coordinator, grant writer. Um, we brought on Peak Consulting Group. They are NEPA experts. They are experts in underutilized communities. So um, if you know anything about these grants, there are a lot of questions surrounding NEPA, underutilized communities, and they are our experts. So even if you had just a question on your grant, you could reach out to us. We could get it to Peak, and they could help you answer some of these complicated questions and help and help you win the grant because we're we're really trying to help you uh, get some grant money. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list of agencies. I talked about thousands of web pages, but on those thousands of web pages, there are lots of grant uh, seminars, webinars. So if you are going for a grant and you really want to be successful, there are some webinars you can review that have maybe happened in the past and you can learn about what they're really looking for, but just a big effort with lots of federal and state agencies involved. And we're happy to uh, coordinate with you. We're happy to meet with you, come and visit with you about what kind of projects that you have out. Um, we'll fit the project type. We'll help you develop a good scope. We'll match that to grants as they come up. And um, we can write, provide grant writing support, all those different kind of good things. And then if you, if you win, hopefully someone in this room will win. And, and if you do, I'd love to hear about your stories of winning grants. We can actually help you with grant tracking and administration of that grant. So uh, I did want to call out a couple great recent um, grant submittals. So uh, one of the things I didn't talk about yet is form coalitions. So uh, Clear Creek County, Gilpin County, the town of Nederland, they have a lot of underserved communities when it comes to broadband. I can't imagine having dial-up modem at this point, but there are people up there that do not have good internet. So they partnered with an ISP, but it wasn't just Clear Creek County where it started. Gilpin got involved, Nederland got involved. They had weekly meetings, and even though um, they didn't agree with everything in the, in the uh, NOFO and thought some of it was a little too specific. They really persevered, and here recently they put in for $42 million worth of uh, capital projects fund through the U.S. Treasury for um, getting some broadband to something like 6,000 people up in those, uh, those counties. Um, and then safe, Safer Streets for All. I'm sure a bunch of you have won Safer Streets for All planning grants. About 20 jurisdictions in Colorado won those. And um, then there'll be implementation grant opportunities next year. So a lot of other stuff is out there being considered. And uh, once again, um, here's some primary contacts in your packet as well. If you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk to you and make time for you. And I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has them. Um, thanks, Paul. Good presentation. Good seeing you. I see you too. Um, Centennial did get the Safe Streets for All planning grant um, for a safer street kind of plan. The transportation plan wasn't enough, even though they almost were. I Nonetheless, we did it. So now going on to, you know, you identify projects. So I'm with the National League of Cities. And so I ask a lot of questions, of course. And so I ask, well, you know, we have this operations, you know, operational uh, improvement project. And uh, do you think this would be a good candidate? And um, they said no. They, they kind of frown from things that look like that. Have you run into that? And then um, uh, the other thing is, is when I'm going to these meetings, it's kind of funny how many people tell me that we really need a lobbyist to help us win these so, thank you. And I think that's a really good question. So um, there are webinars talking about Safer Streets for All. So I definitely recommend, um, now that you've gotten the grant especially, to get, do some research on that. What I understand with that one is on the implementation side, they were looking for particularly innovative demonstration type projects. So I'm um, guessing that's what, what the feedback you got back was. Yeah. Dr. Peck. 
Oh, thank you. That was a great presentation. I think that you answered one of my questions when you mentioned broadband, because I was going to ask, is this only for transportation projects? Um, and Dr. Cog has historically been, historically been for roads and uh, traffic type uh, projects. Would it, rail fit into this at all? As a rail project. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not limited. There's housing type grants. Um, there is energy grants. So a lot of solar, uh, renewables, those kind of things. Uh, transportation, which of course is what I love because I spent 30 years doing it. Um, I don't know what I missed there. Water. water. Yeah, water and sewer. Geez, if there was one item when we talked to the local jurisdictions that everybody mentioned was just a huge backlog of need when it comes to wastewater, stormwater, and drinking water. And um, so there's, there's grants for that as well. So the reason I bring it up is we have a huge cleanup project that is going to be a huge development. Um, it needs a lot of stuff in it, uh, but probably more... Um, I say expertise in how do we get grants for certain parts of the development? Is that something that you would be, uh, your group would be? I mean, obviously we'd need to know the details of okay. whatever that is. I just saw recently a Brownfields grant come out. Oh. So, and, and by the way, there's a, there's a website you can sign up for IIJA Substack, and I just love that too. I mean, <clears throat> granted, they email me a couple emails every week, but every time a new grant opportunity comes out, they actually email it to you as soon as it's actually usually before it comes out, and it has the link to all the information on that. That's where I saw the brownfields come out. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Welcome. Other questions? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, um, Flo, and I don't know if you're planning on doing this. Okay, I'll, she read my mind. I, I, I do have an additional update um, for you. Uh, originally, the contract that we signed with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade was to run through the end of this calendar year. But the governor's office has come back and said, uh, a lot of you got a, kind of a late start, and like for us, we contracted with Paul in April, and 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 uh, even though we hit the ground running, it was really May until we we got some stuff stood up. So um, the governor's office has said we are going to extend the contract for a full year for when your regional grant navigator started. So for us, that'll be in April of 2024. And then beyond that, the governor's office is making available an additional year, which will run from April of 2024 to April of 2025 for this, this particular project service. And I'll be taking that to the um, uh, Budget and Finance Committee next month for, for that contract amendment. But um, that, that's the good news because the uh, governor's office has seen the value of, of, of this program. And as Paul said, you know, don't be shy about reaching out to him or to me with any of your questions. And, 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 and the EPA and, and uh, the EDA, almost every federal agency, USDA, all has specific programs within IIJA, IRA, and ARPA. So, um, you know, Paul and his team have become the experts now. They, they know what, what's out there. So, you know, they're the best person to ask questions, but, you know, I'm always happy to take your call as well. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Flo. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you being here. With that, we will move ahead to an update on the amendment request to the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan received in a call for cycle amendments. And our presenter is Alpha Bidal Sanchez, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Directors. Uh, so my briefing will be on a worth this. Uh, so 
So it'll be uh, an update on a process that we hear Dr. Call, Dr. Call, call cycle amendments. So I'll start with a brief introduction, just a refresher. It actually has been about maybe five years since we've done a full-fledged cycle amendment process with y'all. So we wanted to give you all an update on where we are in this process, the next steps that we're looking at, and even longer term, how this builds into a future RTP that we're already trying to plan out. So we do have a regional transportation plan that was last adopted in September of last year that was in response to the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. Um, we update this plan every four years, and this update actually took enough work that we asked our federal partners to reset our four-year clock, and so they um, agreed, and so we reset that four-year clock for our next major update. And so because we won't be doing that next update to conclude in 2026, we are providing an opportunity for what we, for what our project-based amendments, targeted revisions to projects in the regional transportation plan. Um, there's no set cycle that we do these in. It's just to, in between that major four-year update. So just um, when was the last update? What might have changed in the region that we need to go out to project sponsors to hear what, what might need to be targetedly re revised in the plan? Um, we don't do it every year or set a set cycle because it can take us a bit. Um, on average, at least six months. We're actually building in nine months this time just to make sure we're capturing all the modeling and coordination we need to do related to the greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements that do still apply. So even though this is an amendment, it's only taking nine months, it's not a major four-year update that can take two years. We do still have to meet all of our federal requirements, so fiscal constraint, federal air quality conformity, and our state greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. When we go out for cycle amendments, we're really looking for three main things, adding a new project to the plan that's currently not in the plan, removing a project, or major changes to an existing project. So that could be major scope changes, it could be cost or funding changes, or a completion year change. You're wanting to move a project between those staging periods because you think it could be done sooner or later. For all of these, uh, we did have some justification questions that we were asking since this is a cycle amendments process and not our really rigorous two-year-long effort. We do at least want to make sure that the projects that we're receiving, especially new projects, are uh, consistent with the priorities that we've outlined in the Regional Transportation Plan. So there were some justification questions around those six priorities that we've identified, as well as some rationale and justification questions about the importance of this project to the region, to the community, uh, and the reason that the change needs to be made currently and can't wait till our next major four-year update. We did receive six amendments during the window. Four were for new projects. One was for a scope change, and one was for a staging period. Uh, this list is also included in your memo packet. Uh, I will note that there was a seventh request submitted after the deadline, but we did review it and determined that the scope and the project type wasn't necessary to be evaluated or included in the plan. So that seventh one is not included on this list before you. There's also just a visual representation of what those projects are to give you an idea of the scope of them, their location in the region. They do include, like I mentioned, those four new projects and then a scope change and a staging period change. So right now we're in the middle of reaching out to project sponsors just for some extra information, making sure those applications were complete and we have all the information available to us so we can evaluate those and determine which ones are the most appropriate to move forward during this amendment cycle. So right now we are uh, in that October to December timeframe. We're reaching out to project sponsors. We want to get started on modeling as soon as we can, just to make sure we get through our state greenhouse gas emission reduction work, our air quality work, uh, and do all that coordination that we need to do with our external partners. Following that, we're hoping to have a draft of the regional transportation plan in January of 2024. Uh, when we amend one of these, it's not just the main plan that's changing, it's also a number of appendices. So we're also looking at making some targeted revision to maybe five appendices in the plan. It will also be complete by January of 24. February and March are where we've built public and stakeholder review. So that will include a 30-day public review period, our public hearing, as well as review periods that are necessary for the Transportation Commission and the Air Pollution Control Division. And finally, we're hoping to wrap up the effort with committee and board action in April. And then that will give staff the opportunity to submit all those different requirements and documents to our federal partners. And we'll be looking at making sure the RTP and all of its constituent pieces are accessible as well, making sure that they're meeting the state's accessibility requirements that come into force next summer. 
know, in this cycle amendment process, we're already looking at the next major four-year update to the plan. So that new four-year update has to be complete and approved by winter of 2026. It still has to meet all those various requirements, but for us, a major four-year update typically takes about a year and a half to two years, depending on the scope of what we're looking at. So because of that, after this amendment cycle concludes, we are not intending to provide another opportunity to change projects in the plan until we've adopted the next RTP by 2026. Overlaid with that project are also the two new tips that will be coming down the pipeline. One of those won't have a new call for projects, and then the second one will, and so that's what you're more familiar with, that regional and sub-regional call for projects that we just concluded. Concludes my presentation, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, this is probably very basic, but in the new scope, are, are these opportunities like to expand the corridors that we're looking at from that list? Are those some of the amendments that were being requested? So um, of the projects we selected, one was a scope change, um, changing a widening from two to four lanes to two to six lanes. That was one of the requests we got from our project sponsors, but a major scope change like that is something we would consider during a cycle amendments process. Um, we would just ask, like before an amendment submitted, we just work with y'all to make sure it's a request that needs to be submitted. Um, some projects don't need to be in our regional transportation plan for them to move forward. Um, others don't meet our regionally significant definition. And so uh, part of what we've been doing during this process is reaching out to project sponsors before they submitted amendments just to make sure that they um, had all their ducks in a row and could submit if they needed to or didn't need to because that project can, could continue to move forward in a different way. Let me ask it in a different way. Let's say hypothetically a corridor, let's say West Colfax, for example, wasn't funded, but half of it was particularly listed. Could the city of Lakewood go back in future amendments, I understand that's years out at this point, and ask for the scope of that corridor to be widened to include all of West Colfax? Yes, that would be an eligible request that a product sponsor could make is extending the existing scope for longer um, or cha changing if it was a structure project, that scope that you were looking at for the improvement type. Okay, thank you for that. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate you being here, Alvin. That call your attention to a couple of informational items in the packet, uh, administrative modifications to fiscal year 2024-27 transportation improvement program. Uh, and that is just a packet item, correct? And also administrative modifications for the fiscal year 2024-2025 unified planning work program for the Denver region. So look, uh, we will move ahead to committee reports. The chair requests these reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. We'll start with Nicholas Williams from the City and County of Denver with a report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The stack did meet in October. Uh, two updates, both con kind of continuations from last month's update to, to the board here. Uh, HB 1101, just a reminder, this is a, a, a bill that, among other things, uh, looks at the composition of stack, transportation planning region boundaries, other TPR administrative requirements. Um, ongoing discussions with this, there's still statewide engagement and conversations going around this. One item of note to flag for the board, there's been a discussion of taking Clear Creek and Gilpin counties out of our TPR and combining them with other TPRs for a new Intermountain TPR uh, on that. And so we'll see kind of continued conversation on that. Um, uh, time frame on this, a draft final report can be provided to stack and the Transportation Commission in November, with the Transportation Commission anticipated to open the planning rules in January uh, based on those recommendations. Second item, uh, continuing uh, conversation on the program distribution for the Multimodal Transportation and Mitigations Options Fund, MMOF. Uh, on there, we talked about this last time. Of course, uh, Stack is going through the the weighting and and funding allocations for this. Um, so uh, finalized the funding formula for MMOF uh, on this. Um, as recommended, Dr. Cog would be allocated approximately 58% of the total urban pot, totaling approximately 9.4 million for 24 through 27. Mm -hmm. This is about a million dollars less over the three-year period than would have been available under the previous iteration of the formula. On there. That end of report, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right, moving ahead, report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Wheat Ridge Mayor Bud Starker, Director Starker. 
Thank you, uh, Chair. We had a, a full caucus meeting on October 4th. Uh, we had a legislative discussion with uh, Kevin Bonner with CML, with uh, Ted Lighty from the Boulder uh, Home Builders of Colorado and Jen Penn with Dome Strategies, uh, discussing uh, potential upcoming legislation in the new session. We had partner updates. Uh, Doug Rex with Dr. Cog uh, talked about the uh, housing needs assessment. We had a discussion on uh, Proposition 123. Uh, we had also a presentation from uh, 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 Dr. Lynn with the um, uh, CEO of Denver Health to uh, present with Josh Bloom on their activities in our area. And we were pleased to have Mayor Mike Johnson come with uh, his senior staff, Josh Posner and Cole Chandler, to talk about the Denver housing and homelessness updates. And with that, concludes my report. Thank you very much, sir. A uh, report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, and we have Steve Odorizia, Director of Odorizia. Yeah, thank you. We had our meeting last month. Uh, we have another up this Friday. Um, we're going to continue talking about um, stuff about housing support services, maybe playbook on housing support services that are across the different counties. Last month we did meet, uh, discuss, of course, uh, as always, it's the housing and homelessness is the biggest day for Nobody else in here? Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, we keep talking about the different uh, ways in which we can share ideas, and, and it has actually produced quite a bit of good dialogue and actual information sharing. Not, not just collabo babble, but actual uh, follow-up. Uh, so it's been really good, and we hope to continue that effort. Collabble babble. I know. <laughs> I have learned something new today. Thank you very much for collabble babble. Copyrighted. With that, <laughs> okay. Moving on to the report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez Warren. Hello, everyone. Um, I told Chuck this meeting is going really fast, so I can talk a really long time. No, not just <laughs> kidding, right? Um, uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging had its first in-person meeting in over three years, which was quite exciting. Really good to see everybody. Awesome. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, we talked a lot about the awareness and advocacy campaign that we are embarking on. As you may recall, uh, area agencies on aging across the state are losing critical state funding, um, which means those people who need services like transportation, nutrition, and in-home services and many more um, may have a hard time getting them. And some may not get services at, uh, at all because they'll be eliminated. It also means the 33 service providers that the Dr. Cog Area Agency on Aging Funds um, will, have, uh, will receive less money from the Area Agency on Aging um, because if we have less money, we have less to give out, right? So the advisory committee um, reviewed uh, you may know that we are asking the governor to increase funding for the area agencies on aging, um, $5 million plus a formula that would include uh, the state's older population plus inflation as a way to keep us um, current or at least not having to go back every single year to ask for funding. Um, we, we need to create awareness campaign because so many people don't understand why this import, is important. How many people do you know that knows that the aging uh, or the, the 65 plus population is the fastest growing segment of the population, right? They don't understand why this is important. They don't know that community-based services saves the state money in Medicaid because People don't have to go to a higher level of care if we provide them community-based services, and they don't have to go on Medicaid. Um, the, the advisory committee reviewed uh, some information that we have. We have a, a flyer, gave us some really wonderful feedback, uh, recommended things like a toolkit for information and facts that we could share in different formats, like for our contracted service providers to use. Um, it, they, they requested an elevator speech so they could say um, uh, correctly, uh, advocate for um, what we were asking. We were looking at targeted populations and how to use social media. So it was very, very valuable meeting for the AAA staff for sure. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully will be um, the information we got will, will help us be more effective advocates for older adults. 
Do you all want to say anything else? I'm, I'm going to add something in. <laughs> uh, of course, and it was it was absolutely great having that group together in person. Uh, a lot of people I've seen just in boxes on a screen for for years. Uh, but thank you to you and your staff for doing it. One of the, the conversations that came up talking about trying to get people to understand that, that, that demographic, we have more people over 65 than under 18, um, is trying to find younger voices to be able to articulate talk about that. You know, if, you, if you have somebody that is older saying, oh, take care of the old people, it's easy for people to, to, to set that aside or think it's, it's, it's self-interest. Whereas if we can find younger voices that can articulate those realities, that can help in some of the, the social media and the, in the, the print and the, you know, those type of things. So if people in here know of young, younger voices that are articulate in, in those issues, share that with Jayla. Uh, or whoever you'd like that to be shared with. But, but that can make a difference because part of that conversation was the challenge in helping people understand the realities of our changing demographic, and, and that seems to be one of the things that might help. Lynn, did you have anything at all to add? Just that, um, you know, this $5 million that Jayla had mentioned that um, we're requesting from the governor uh, doesn't is it, just a little over half of the shortage that Dr. Cog will have. So it it's really critical, and I I I hate to think of people losing services, but that's going to happen. And this group, as as we talk to people, can help educate people about some of those realities. So Jayla, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing for your passion. With that, we will turn it over to our Executive Director, Doug Rex, with a report from the Regional Air Quality Council. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The Regional Air Quality Council met, had its monthly meeting on October 6th, and there was one action item, um, and it was a revision to Chapter 5 of the uh, Severe Ozone State Implementation Plan, and it was just basically adding some additional language. There was a request from the committee to add some additional language making reference to the emission control pro programs, um, although not included in the attainment demonstration itself, uh, what, what is anticipated to be uh, air quality improvements as a result of those programs. And also there was a request to include additional language related to how climate change might impact summertime ozone. So that was, those were the only action items. I will say that um, uh, there were uh, so we had our ozone season end of year report. Um, we, you know, we exceeded almost all the monitors within this region for sure. But I did want to share that the actual number of days which um, we were above 70 parts per billion, which is um, the, the newest standard, uh, was 35 days in 2022 and it was 26 in 2023. So moderate improvement. Uh, in that, uh, we also had a, a presentation about how fire and smoke affects air quality in the region. Lord knows we've seen enough of that the last few years. And um, RTD gave a presentation on their new transit fare structure, which we're all very appreciative. And thank you to our friends at RTD. With that, sir, that's my report. Thank you, Dick. What's up? What, what was the uh, parts per million? It's, that's the new standard? It's 70 parts per billion. Per, okay. Got it. Billion. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Next up, report from the E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Hi. Um, there was a bit of a change in structure at E-470, which delayed our budget retreat. Um, so the budget retreat is going, or workshop rather, will be uh, readjusted and rescheduled. The executive director has resigned to join his family in North Carolina for personal reasons. Uh, it was a difficult transition. So that's really all we have today. Thank you very much. Report from CDOT, Darius Packbaz. Sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, to start off uh, just on the, 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 the news that's on the national front, um, uh, other than what's in the, what you have seen in the newspapers, I don't have too much to report on the train derailment other than the northbound lanes of I-25 north of Pueblo are still closed. The National Transportation Safety Board is still investigating that incident and is on site. Other news. Um, 
uh, CDOT and the F and FHWA hosted the public meeting on October 10th, 2023rd at the Eagle Point Recreation Center, Commerce City for the environmental impact study on the I-270 corridor improvement project. So soliciting feedback from the public on that. We had 80 attendees and even more comments uh, from email and uh, uh, surveys and uh, other other efforts. So overall, attendees were highly engaged and provided comments and thoughts on that. Um, uh, another item in the region is State Highway 5, which is the Mount Blue Sky Road is closed for the season, and that is uh, uh, will be opened again in late May of 2024. Um, and then the Transportation Commission is meeting, uh, has met, and will meet again tomorrow, the actual meeting tomorrow in the workshop uh, earlier today. Discussions included FY24 budget amendments, the new budget for next year, uh, the audit committee met and the bridge and tunnel enterprise and the fuels impact enterprise will meet tomorrow. And that concludes my report. I'm open to any questions from board members. And at the regional transportation committee meeting, there was conversation about a, a number of new transportation commissioners, correct? Correct. Though they took their seats last month. I think one, um, is going to be sworn in who was unable to attend, but uh, this is going to be their second time on uh, uh, meeting uh, in their spots. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, next up, report from RTD, Brian Welch. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, directors. Three quick things. Pending our board of directors approval, our legislative program this year will include requesting that the legislature consider enhanced penalties for assaults on transit operators. Interestingly enough, uh, Colorado has uh, m much more lenient, I guess that's the right word, standards related to assaults on transit operators than other states, and we really seek that, that that needs to change in our state. Second, next month, I will brief you on zero fare for better air. We owe that report to the Colorado Energy Office on November 15th, so I can give you all the details on that. And then finally, we have completed, let's see, it's the third year that we've done a customer community and stakeholder survey, and there's a lot of information on our website, but real quickly, the survey findings indicate that 76% of bus customers and 78% of rail customers are satisfied or very satisfied with RTD services. Additionally, the percentage of customers who were very dissatisfied <laughs> decreased in comparison with 2022. Many more details on the website if you'd like to investigate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, administrative items, again, reminder about the parking passes if you park downstairs to get that from the students. Uh, also, don't go out these doors because the, the rotating doors are locked. You'll be stuck outside and not be able to get to your car. So go out the, the back way and we'll help if you haven't been that way, help direct. Uh, our next board meeting, regular board meeting, is uh, Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Are there other matters by members? Seeing none, thank you all for all you do. Thank you for being here. Thank you, staff. Everybody have a great night. We are adjourned.